welcome and uh, welcome particularly to Charlie who's in Sykes or aka gin fueled <laughs> blue stocking and also to Ross Bryant who's the brand ambassador for number Hi, three Ross. gin. <laughs> It was very exciting actually this year because we we normally run People's Choice Wine Awards and 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 this year so for the 2021 uh, awards we actually included eight spirits categories and uh, two for gin and this 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 was one of them and um, it was a very popular very very popular category because there's masses of gins out there at the moment and uh, these two as I say were, 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 the, were the runner up and the winner and the nice thing is uh, I think you've all got them uh, is the sponsor of the category was Double Dutch oh. and uh, for those of you who've got the cans we've got the lovely Double Dutch tonics <laughs> which were a perfect match with, with the gin. So um, so everybody's got their Wine Society gin tea and you've, uh, uh, I presume, or, or if you're well ahead, maybe you've moved on to the other one on it. Excellent. Um, I will let you pour and I will waffle while you pour and serve yourselves. Um, so I'm, I'm a bit of a fan of the Wine Society gin, not only because it is insanely competitively priced. I don't know if you've had a look at the price. It's 17 pounds a bottle. Yeah, that it's it's a bit of a bargain. So never never mind buying, spending money on wine. You'll make your forty quid back from the wine society just on the gin. Not a problem. Um, so it is insanely competitively priced, but also because it's it's a bit of a dark horse. Not many people know it exists for a start. Secondly, it's a decent. It's really decent price. Thirdly, it's a really good gin. And it's also made by a really well-known manufacturer. So obviously the Wine Society are not going to make their own gin. They're going to ask somebody else to do it. And they've asked Charles Maxwell to do it of Thames Distillery. And Thames Distillery was set up in the um, mid-1990s and has around about 60 different labels that it makes. It was also pivotal, Charles was pivotal in um, brands like Portobello Road being set up. He helped them develop their own gin and their own gin style and their own gin flavour. But he also has a massive family history in gin. So he started working for the family gin company two years before I was born. So he's been working in gin since 1976. And on his very first day, I understand they had him taste it straight from the still. He says he thinks it's probably because his dad didn't want him raiding the gin cupboard at home. I cannot substantiate these claims because I don't know his dad, but I wouldn't be surprised because tasting it straight off the still is a really, it's, I've done it myself, it's punchy. It comes off at about 97%. So it's, <laughs> you don't really taste it. It hits your tongue and evaporates. So you kind of inhale it. And then if you're like me, as I was standing with a bunch of burly blokes who are all coughing and choking on it, me being the only girl trying to hold it in, turning slightly puffy red in the face and trying to hold that little choke of cough of inhaling gin in. It's great, it's driven smooth, really smooth. Do we all have gin? I'm seeing lots of nods and lots of big glasses. Oh, nice serves. So a London dry style gin, is not like the name suggests has to be distilled in London. It doesn't have to be distilled in London. It's just a particular style. It's what's known as juniper forward, which means you should be able to taste the juniper. That should be one of the things that absolutely sings. And I think both in this and in number three, it really does. It's a good, strong backbone, but you will also have other botanicals in there. Usually, but not always, you'll have coriander you'll have angelica and you'll quite often have orris root. The latter two are what's known as fixatives um, and they tend to help blend the flavours together but you also get flavours directly from them anyway so you, angelica will give you a little bit of earthiness and orris root might give you a little bit of creaminess. Um, I'm curious to see what you can pick out flavour wise because this is quite a classic gin but it does have a couple of interesting botanicals going on what you can taste in this gin when you drink it. I was going to say grapefruit but that's obviously citrus but a bit tart. Yep you might get as well a slight soft lemon flavour coming through everybody's palate's different so everybody will pick out different flavours so don't worry if you're not picking out something that somebody else is. Um, you might get kind of a softer lemon. It's almost like um, a powdery lemon, and that tends to come from coriander. 
Um, and that for me, or it often comes through and sometimes in some uh, gins where they use the still, but it's quite hot, I tend to get like almost a toasted coriander flavor, which almost kind of goes slightly honeyed. You can go absolutely crazy and put all sorts of different flavors in it. But this one, they've kind of stuck to really classic flavors, but with that slightly savory edge. It's interesting talking about Double Dutch as a brand, because... For me, I think it's there are some tonics out there that are quite quite tonicy and actually can affect the flavour of the gin. What I like mm. about Double Dutch is it's quite neutral. It's almost getting towards a soda water. Not it's not, but it's getting towards that, and therefore it allows the gin when you use either the the Indian or the skinny Double Dutch, you allow the gin flavours to come through. Then obviously, as as Charlie says, you get all the flavoured tonics. But I think Double Dutch, for me personally, is, is my favourite of the tonics, simply because yeah. it doesn't actually yeah. taste too tonicy. And I know a lot of people think they don't like it in tonic. It's actually tonic they don't like. And when they've been introduced to the likes of Double Dutch, they actually realise that in comparison to, should we say, other brands, um, it's the tonic element of the gin and tonic they don't like. And when they try things like Double Dutch or maybe other non-tonic mixes, mm -hmm. actually they really do like gin after all, which is great news. But I think it's a great shout to use Double Dutch. I really like them as, uh, as a mixer. Yeah, it's got a kind of softness about it. It's mm. not harsh. It's not sharp. It's not overly bitter, which some of them are. Some of them really, the, the bitterness kind of overwhelms the palate and you don't get anything coming through. You need like a really punchy gin to, to power through that. Yeah. And there are some punchy gins that would do it. But this works for so many different styles of gin yeah. that you might as well just you might as well just keep buying the one that works with almost everything. Uh, so, Ross, you're the brand ambassador for number three. Is that right? That is correct. Um, um, uh, what does a brand ambassador do? I'm, I'm still trying to figure that out. Um, <laughs> it's a funny one. Um, how, hi, thank you for having me. So, really, to, to start about the history of number three, Jim, we need to learn about Prairie Brewers and Rugs, um, which is the oldest wine and spirit merchant, we think, in the world. Um, it was established originally in 1698, originally as a tea and coffee merchant. Uh, later moving into wine and spirits. Uh, why am I mentioning Bobros and Rudd? Uh, they own number three gin um, and created that wonderful liquid that we know and love that we've got in this glass in front of us, hopefully. Um, we like to partner with experts in their field. So whether it's bottling wine, which we do a lot of, or if it's creating you know, a world's best liquid, we want to partner with the best possible partner for that. So. We landed upon a distillery in Skidam in Holland called Royal de Kuiper Distillers um, for a few key reasons. One, they're a family-owned business, much like us, still to this day, and they hold a very similar ethos to us uh, on a day-to-day -day business level, which is really important when we want to partner with anyone. Um, second, they've been distilling for over 300 years. They're actually slightly older than us as a company, uh, and one of, much like us, the oldest uh, family-owned companies in the world. So they know distilling inside out, um, which again is really important when we've got this huge brief to create a world's best gin. And lastly, Ski Dam and Holland really in general is generally deemed to be the birthplace of gin and uh, Geneva, juniper spirits. Um, the oldest recipe we've found dates back to 1495 in Ski Dam. So such rich history and heritage uh, in, this, in this part of the world. So we've got our distillery. Next, we need a master distiller we landed upon Dr. David Platten, who's the only man in the world to hold a PhD in gin. Uh, so he certainly knows a thing or two about juniper. Uh, I don't know who um, marked this. I don't know how you become the first person in that, but alas, uh, he knows it well enough to be the only person in the world. Uh, now, juniper is an obvious one. I'll, I'll lead with that. It is a London dry style gin. Um, Charlie, obviously, went into great detail into the London Dry, so I won't, um, won't recap that. Thank you, Charlie. Um, so it does lead with juniper, that is the dominant kind of botanical in this, but we do have several others. So if you just have a little think about what you can pick up from that. What else? I would say probably more coriander. It's, it's, it's got the classic G&T, lemon, coriander, but it's, it's all taken up a notch. Yeah. It's like supercharged. Cool. Okay. So one important factor here as well is this is um, 
This is 46% ABV, so slightly higher than not all gins, but quite a lot of gins on the market. Uh, and that was a very considered option for us, largely, I think, from the bartender's side of the panel and that in mixed drinks, they wanted that slightly higher ABV to really shine through. Uh, you imagine with a gin and tonic, if we're adding one part gin, three parts tonic, we want this to really carry through and, and be the star of the show. Um, so that added ABV is, is probably a part of that as well. Juniper is first and foremost, our obviously our first one. It, it's, a, it's a gin which must contain juniper. It's a London dry, so it must be the dominant component, um, it's, it's, at least by weight and kind of flavor profile. Next, we have citrus. Uh, so Laura, spot on orange, sweet orange specifically from Seville. Um, so on that kind of sweeter end of a citrus spectrum, uh, nice and zesty and fragrant. And then our other citrus is pink grapefruit. Um, so again, kind of sweeter citrus, lovely and aromatic and fresh, quite bright. Uh, so you might get a little bit of that on the nose, certainly on the palate. And lastly, um, Sorry, I can only read your iPad's name. So Simon, it definitely wasn't question, I don't believe, but uh, about spice, uh, about saying pepper. So there is not pepper in this, but we we sum this up into botanical pro into flavor profiles because it's it's quite easy to understand broadly flavor profiles. Um, if I say what does Angelica root taste like, nine times out of ten, I don't think you'd be able to tell me. But to drill it down to spice, there is an understanding there. So next is spice, our flavor botanicals, which there are three. So we have green cardamom, which is really aromatic, kind of full of Eastern promise. It's got that lovely, uh, bright, aromatic note, which is certainly prevalent on the nose, I feel, um, and towards the back of the palate, if you try that neat. Next, uh, Dan, you've nailed this. Um, there's coriander seeds. So coriander seeds are generally quite slightly earthy uh, and kind of spice, but they also lend quite a citrusy note as well. So that pairs up really well with our obviously citrus botanicals and our juniper. And lastly, angelica roots, which Charlie alluded to is, is very much a binding agent, does bind things together. It doesn't lend too much in terms of flavor profile, but on the palate, it does lend a drying uh, quality to the back of the palate. I will dive in with one more thing before any questions crop up. Um, the still that we use is very important as well, actually. Uh, at Royal Dekaiba Distillers. Uh, they have many a still. Ours is over 100 years old. It's a copper pot still. Um, it's very small in capacity, just 3,100 litres. And what's most unusual, I feel, is it's encased in brick, which is pretty seldom seen these days. Uh, what that does is it acts essentially as a kind of uh, insulating jacket. And it keeps that temperature very constant, uh, which is very important for us. So that does lend, that does, that isn't a, a tribute of our end liquids when we go through the distillation process. Texture is a big thing and that helps. That probably leads on quite well to a perfect serve actually and you know and every gin out there has a perfect serve. We do, I've, I've got a slice of pink grapefruit and a mm -hmm. um, sprig of rosemary. Pink grapefruit of course is one of our botanicals so that will help uh, kind of bring out that botanical. Rosemary is not but it does pair very nicely and it lends that lovely kind of warming earthier um, aromatic notes. Ross, just as a matter of interest, how much does this retail at? I think this is a really nice gin. Mm. Summer through gin retails at 36 pounds. It's a good price. Yeah. Mm. yeah, it's lovely. Yeah, it's a really nice gin. I love yeah. the aftertaste. It lasts longer than any gin I can remember having, yeah. and that might be the higher uh, alcohol content, like you said. Yeah, I think that's, that's definitely that's definitely a big factor. Um, and also, I think our kind of spirit base, well, it, it does help kind of hold it on the palate for that little bit longer. Uh, I just want to say a massive thank you to Ross and also to Charlie uh, for talking us through both of those gins. And yeah, cheers to you. That was a really, really interesting session. Mm -hmm.